Well, hello there. Thanks for tuning in on YouTube today to catch up with this lecture. I'll see you all in person on Monday. Let's get this show on the road here, or work here. I'm going to pick up the PowerPoint a little bit later than where we left it on Wednesday because the fun part of the group discussion that I want to have is there. So I want to talk a little bit about where we go from that exercise and some of the things that are mentioned in chapter one. So what I want you to have in your heads about this is that we talked about different kinds of classes you've had, and we've talked a little bit about science. And I threw the topic of the English classroom in there because English is a situation where some opinions are better than others. Some interpretations are more warranted than others. And evidence is martial to support a given viewpoint, but yet we don't think of English as a science. Similarly, we often don't think of history as a science. What I'm getting at here by means of this introduction and having you think about the classes you've had in college so far and thinking about which are science and which are not science is something that's known as the demarcation problem. So that's a key term, and that is, is a term you're accountable for. And the demarcation problem is basically how to distinguish what is science and what is not science. So on the one hand, you know, is astrology a science? Hmm, maybe not. Uh, is English a science? Probably not, but we're less certain about why that's the case. And it's not just necessarily that it's good or it's bad, because we can think about art and literature and even religious beliefs. That does are they scientific? Well. Now, on what basis would we make some decisions about that? Let's kind of stroll down memory lane a little bit and think about old ideas of science. And one of the things that you'll hear people in universities in America talk about is science as producing scientific statements. And those are factually significant. And in order to be a factually significant fact or scientific statement, you have to verify it. And in order to be verifiable, it has to be measuring something in the observable world or facts that can be reduced from a derived experience. So to talk a little bit about, you know, what are facts and what are not facts, religious beliefs are not facts, according to the logical positivism circle. Emotions are not facts, actually. They have to be something out in the real world, something that will move the needle on a dial on a brass instrument, you know, is kind of what the stereotypic example is. And to the extent that we can observe these facts in the world and make a catalog of them, science is piling up these facts. And that was a really popular idea. And it came about in around the 1920s uh, within a circle of philosophers known as the Vienna Circle. Vienna was a really cool place for to be, you know, because during that time you had a chap called Sigmund Freud running around. You also had, to some extent, Jung running around. You also had people who were followers of Karl Marx. You know, it's a very a, a great time of intellectual ferment. And the Vienna Circle had as its program or its objective to categorize what these scientific statements are and to think about how to organize all our scientific statements in our model so that we can verify them and develop this pure idea of what's going to be a science and what the various groups of science are. But for a little problem, psychologists have a different view of science. Karl Popper was a psychologist <clears throat> who was arguably, well, pretty simply, the most quoted philosopher of the last century. He had an extremely long run. He started in 1899 and lived to see the end, the fall of the Berlin Wall. He was from Vienna. And his idea was that something is scientific if I could somehow observe observations that would contradict the theory. So it's not necessarily observing things that are going to be in line with my theory. There are these you know, three original psychologists, Freud, Adler, and Carl Jung. 
at that time. And Karl Popper was a student of Adler. And in talking about cases, you know, of therapy, Popper was struck by the fact that his advisor would say, oh, yes, I mean, this is what's going on with the kid. And after a while, Popper said, well, you know, how do you know that? You've never even seen this kid. And the person said, well, because of my vast experience. And the thing that bothered him about this whole idea of logical positivism and psychology as it was being made at the time is they had an excuse for everything. If something didn't turn out, they said, well, you know, obviously to really deeply appreciate the psychological mechanisms that work, this is what is going on. So logical positivism is an example of what is called scientism. This is a term that is raised in the book. And this is an excessive belief in the power of a scientific method or technique. I really have to remember a graduate student from our department that I was interviewing for my Department of Education Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education grant. And I said, do you think we'll ever know whether, say, alcoholism is genetically caused or not? And she said, oh, yeah, science is a rocket. We're going to know for sure one day. We'll definitely know. And the elements of scientism that are a problem is that science will tell us what is ethical or moral. And science doesn't necessarily do that. Lord Acton commented that no actions can be deduced from facts, although actions have a great deal to do with facts. Just because we have a scientific model of behavior, it's not going to tell us what is morally good or ethical. There's also the belief in scientism that someday science is going to give us a correct answer. Well, that's a little <clears throat> disturbing because we would sure as hell hope that we've been studying all of this time and we would expect that science is going to come up with an answer at some point. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in psychology. As a matter of fact, it doesn't happen in physics or chemistry either. And getting comfortable with that fact and thinking about where your opinions stand and how you evaluate what experts are currently saying is a big task. And I think one that's a little more appropriate for college than say in high school. The other problem of scientism is that science or even one discipline inside of science is the only way to know things, that everything can be reduced to a, for example, psychological problem. And that's really not true. So I talked with you on Wednesday about the fact that you know I research alcohol problems in young people. Well, alcohol is a problem. As I said in some of the examples of cases that have happened at Mizzou regrettably. But alcohol is not just a psychological problem. It's a personal problem. It's a medical problem. It's a social problem. It's a family problem in your extended family. It's a genetic problem. I mean, in all of those different ways, scientists package the problem differently. They weigh evidence differently, and they come to sometimes different and conflicting conclusions on the basis of that. So you know, to avoid scientism, it's always kind of good to sit down and think about what's going on with respect to the problem and who is doing the looking at the problem. I talked a little bit last time about it, but you know, this deserves a slide. Science is an attempt to know something, but scientific conclusions are not certain universal, necessary, or timeless. They're often conditional and uncertain in particular. And you need to think about when a theory is true, to what extent the theory is true, and for who, when you read science. Now, one of the objectives of Morling's book is to also have you be more literate consumers of what's going on in the world, how to read the newspaper, how to read scientific magazines, and so forth. There are some key phrases that come in that might alert you to the fact that this person is subscribing to scientism. We now know 
you know, if you see that over and over in an article, eh, maybe not, or my personal favorite, the evidence shows clearly you know, this is it. Or, or my conclusion is based on a lot of data. I have a sample size of 15,000. So therefore, you know, we know that what I'm saying is true. Another little word that you're going to get exposed to is called pre-registration. And this has to do with the fact that, you know, there's a whole bunch of statistics you can throw at data. There's a whole bunch of tests you can throw at it. When I first started here in 1989, uh, I was consulting for people on their statistics. And I was surprised that one person came to my meeting, to my office hours, and said, I've got this printout. They were really old printouts, and there was a printout about that thick in terms of pages. And I want you to help me go through it. I went, oh, okay. Well, what had happened is this person had purchased a statistics manual for a software package and had taken their data set and run every statistical analysis in the entire book. And every time there was a p-value with a significant, they circled it or they did a highlighter with it. And they had a little tab for it and they wanted me to explain to them what it was they were doing. Well, if you're going to chase your numbers through, I believe at that point it was 64 different statistics packages and looking at p-values, you're going to have something that's significant, even though, you know, probably that's not, it's just on the basis of chance you're going to get something coming up. Pre-registration is the idea that a scientist can commit to doing one technique and one technique only before they look at the data. And then after they look at the data, they say, oh, well, now I'll make a decision if it's significant or not. But even pre-registration, we'll have more to say about this in the coming weeks, even pre-registration is not going to fix the problem. Or even when you think I have the analysis down and I did it right, this does not necessarily breed certainty in the conclusions. That's a little disturbing. Let's spin back to the book. <clears throat> when we're talking about science, scientists are empiricists. Empiricist means they are looking at data, at something observable. That's a little bit different than psychology used to be. There was a psychologist by the name of Boring who used the method of introspection. That is, the idea originally was to do psychology. You sit down and you think about how you are thinking. And based on that, you can say, well, here's my theory about how I perceive, how I look at things, or how I do mathematical calculations in my head. The only problem with subjectivity is you can't verify it. You can't say, well, my head works this way. And you go, well, does your head work the same way? I don't know. We can't really argue because we're not looking at any common set of data. Second point, scientists work in a community. You're never a lone person doing things out there. You publish things, you write an article. You know, I have been incredibly collaborative during my time at Mizzou. I work with a, a small group of other faculty. That's good. When you want to report those results out, it goes out to journal editors. Those journal editors have reviewers. They evaluate the quality of the work. And based on that, you make changes to it and you send it back in. You disseminate, you publish this, and other people in other countries, other journals, other outlets will do that reading, and they'll tell you what they think of it. They will build on it. They will do something more. Scientists look at applied and basic problems. Now, in past semesters, people have kind of wanted to know to talk a little bit about that and the idea of translational research, and there'll be more on this PowerPoint on that, but basic problems can be very closely wedded to the model that you've got, the phenomenon, the perception, how reaction times work, how people blink their eyes, what causes you to increase your rate of breathing, what, what physiological things will go on in you when you become anxious. And there are applied problems. How can we improve instruction in college classes? How can we keep children from being violent on the playground? How can we work with someone to reduce their problematic gambling behavior, for example? So you know, 
those are both types of problems. And well, what the heck is a problem? I'll have more to say about that a little bit later as well. <clears throat> Next, scientists make their work public. It does no good to write something and have a nice little paper and have it sit in a file on your computer. You communicate it. You communicate it to the scientific community. And that last point, you communicate it to the larger society, both to improve society. Hopefully, we're trying to tell people things that will enable them to live better lives and also to justify the financial investment that society makes to keep people like myself and you in universities thinking about things and hopefully going out to the world to improve it. So let's talk a little bit about empiricism. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Psychology, Wundt, Titchener, and Boring from 1875. I'm about, you know, psychology was about 100 years old when I started college uh, until around the, eighth and the end of the 1800s. Uh, they did introspection, and you would observe your mental state. You couldn't make any tests on it. Now, the funny thing is, as I'm reading this book, thinking, well, you know what? An awful lot of psychology is asking people in surveys and interviews what they think about. Well, that's kind of other people's introspection. The difference here is that when you record other people's introspection, you have some data. Somebody else can turn around and analyze it. So, you know, fMRIs, functional magnetic resonance images, are also things that go on inside the mental state of someone. So in the book, she talks a little bit about this theory data cycle. <clears throat> and Harlow's monkey study is probably a good example of that. Kind of conceptual interest on this, and not to harp on the whole alcohol thing, Harlow was a very productive researcher. He unfortunately studied, suffered from alcohol, alcoholism, and died of it eventually. But, you know, what he started in his work was this idea of how is it that parents become attached to their mothers, or why are they attached to their mothers? Now, at that time, a lot of behaviorism with Burris Frederick Skinner was going on saying, you know, there's this theory that infants become attached to their mothers because the mother is the source of nutrition and the source of food. And as a result, you know, just by exposing the organism, the child to this reinforcement, they become attached to this source of nourishment. On the other hand, there's this theory that animals attach because of the comfort, the physical tactile comfort that is supplied by the mother. And, you know, she talks about this quite a bit in the book, but here we have the example of the two mothers. The one mother on the left, which is essentially a wire cage, contains a nipple that a person can actually feed from, and the mother, so to speak, on the right does not provide food, but does have features that look more close to, you know, the animal that you're, that you're looking at, plus it's got all this wonderful terry cloth covering. And the thinking was, is there's these two theories, the cupboard theory, that is you, you go there to get your food and the contact theory, there are two models. I can generate an experiment and expose these animals to these two mothers and see which one they prefer. Taking a look at the book, she talks about this in light of the theory data cycle. Now, I'm going to have a few more things to say about this in the next few slides, but let's kind of walk through this and think about how this goes. The, the nice thing about this diagram is that it doesn't just a binary choice. You don't just say, oh, I'm going to look at this, gather some data, and make my decision and stop. So starting out here at the top, she believes that we start out with the theory, and this then leads you to pose research questions like, well, I wonder if exposed to two different types of caregivers, which one they would prefer. This then leads down the middle here to a research design, the, the two mothers that we just saw on the previous slides. Now, hopefully, 
you know, she's saying the nice thing is, well, maybe you should pre-register. You should say, I'm going to count the number of times the animals in my study prefer one or the other and do maybe a t-test or a chi-square test. And then based on all of that, I'm going down the bottom here, collect some data. Well, what's going to happen in this particular case, that comfort mother was preferred a lot more. That then goes up the left-hand arm here to support, support and strengthen the theory, which leads, and that support in turn leads me to generate maybe another theory or a more, more refined theory. What happens if it doesn't work? Maybe my data doesn't work and I have non-supporting data. Well, a couple of things could go wrong there. Maybe my study wasn't designed well. And you know, I just didn't give enough attention to, in this case, maybe how monkeys behave and how much time it would be needed for a monkey to attach to one or the other. So maybe I would go back and look at a different research design. Maybe I might look at a different revised theory. I might say, well, you know, in addition to maybe they're just being terry cloth there, maybe that also needs to convey some heat, maybe put a light bulb in and maybe the heat and the terry cloth would provide a comforting mother. On the other hand, continuing on, maybe I need to revise my theory. Maybe I need to say, oh, you know, that was wrong. We're going to kill that theory and move on to another theory. Now, the problem with that, if you know, you think about what I've talked about in these earlier slides, is that actually maybe gathering data that fits my theory doesn't really support the theory or strengthen it in any way. You know, I just gathered more data. I failed to kill off a theory, maybe, but that doesn't necessarily make that theory true. So here's some key points. I'm doing research, studies don't prove theories. And that's you know, one of the things that's a little bit uncomfortable at the beginning of thinking about research. And this is true not only of psychology research, but other areas as well. What makes a theory good? It's falsifiable. One of the problems with Sigmund Freud's theory of psychoanalysis at the beginning is they had an answer for everything. If you didn't believe the theory, well, this is due to your attachment problems, due to your psychosexual development, because the theory must be true. Well, if you can't say there's going to be something out there that's going to falsify my theory, it's not a very good theory. A theory is never going to be completely true. A good theory is actually an oversimplification. To state it a little more forcefully, a good theory is a well-crafted lie. It oversimplifies the data in a way that you can get away with. The idea is that if you had a complete theory that perfectly explained the data, it would be useful, useless, because it would be so complicated that you could make no predictions based on it. You couldn't use the theory in any way. We've had lots of theories as a discipline, and we'll talk more about that later, like when we talk about ethics or when we talk about revisions to models. But this theory cycle is present. It's a little bit useful, but always remember the points that are on this slide when you're thinking about that theory data cycle in the previous slide. <clears throat> I can't resist a few nice quotes. A theory is never true. The method of science depends on our attempts to describe the world with simple theories because theories that are complex can be unstable, even if they are true. Science is the art of systematic oversimplification, the art of discerning what we may with advantage omit. Well, what's wrong with looking at things? Well, one of the problems with looking at things is that you can't just look at them and say, oh, and no, I'm going to write down data. All observation is theory laden. And I was trying to think of a nice example of this. And here you go on the right-hand side, 
you will see observations that scientists made very reliably with the advent of sufficiently powerful microscopes. They were looking at a human sperm and they looked inside, but hey, you know what? There's a little person all curled up in there. And lots of other people saw it too. And based on that, they drew the, the diagrams that you see over here to the right, the different bodies, you know, some of them are a little bit more stout than others over there. You know, they verified it. Anything that you look at is already theory laden. You look at people with an expectation. Let me tell you a little story about that. You know, I think I may have mentioned that you know, part of my life has been lived in America and part of it in Germany. And the little town that my mom came from at that time only had 35,000 people in it, and they had glorious bakeries in it. And you could go in, say, two in the afternoon and get these beautiful Windbeutels, and uh, they're called cream horns and delicious things. And you go in and buy one and walk down the street and eat it. And people would see you eating it and they would smile and they would say, schmecks, you know, does, does it taste good? And, you know, you tell them, oh, yeah, sure it does. Um, that's not something we do here in America. And the other odd thing about that, you know, when I came to America, I went, well, you know, if you're walking down the street and you pass someone, you say hello to them. Well, I don't know what your experiences in Colombia are, but no one really does that when I'm walking down the street by myself. It kind of changed, though, for me. You know, my, my conclusions on the basis of that were Americans are basically unfriendly people and they don't want to have any contact with anybody because they'll just walk by like they're some kind of a ghost. A few years later, um, we, I helped to get uh, Julian Thayer here, who was a black musician, who's a psychologist who looks at the field of induced emotion and biomedical research for minority populations. And walking down the streets with Julian, completely different experience of Colombia. Other people of color across the street would wave at Julian, would wave at us, and we'd have this wonderful conversation. It just seemed thoroughly normal. Hmm, you know, my theories were wrong. And also my theories were particular to the experience of just walking down the street by myself. So I now have kind of a much different view about how people are. Now, people of color, if I talk to them in the street by myself, they don't say hi back to me either. But I know that it's also possible that there are other things out there, other possibilities. So, you know, a little bit of a note from my own education. Karl Popper used to have this lecture uh, procedure where he would say, okay, everyone take out your pencils and I want you to observe. And then he would stand there. And people would say, well, what do you want us to observe? That's exactly the point. You can't just say, observe. You've got to have some focus on your attention. You might even need to have some kind of a problem before you start to make those observations. Here's Karl Popper's model of problem solving. First of all, you got to have a problem. Well, what's a problem? A problem is an expectancy that is violated. When an infant is born into the world, it has up to this point been successfully fed and nourished. It's born. That umbilical cord is no longer there. The expectations are violated. Or to draw examples more close to your own experience, you are all, because you're here, you've probably mostly been really successful in high school. You come to college, these Teachers don't act like the teachers you had in high school. It was really super stressful for me when I was starting out in college. That's a big expectancy violation. That's a problem. So that encourages you to do something in response to it. The little baby will start making hand movements. It'll grimace. It will start to do things. It will say, maybe I need to do something to get some food around here. Or if you're in a college classroom, you might say, well, you know, maybe the teacher just doesn't like people much, or maybe they don't like me, or maybe they just need a friend, or maybe they need someone to compliment them. And, you know, to some extent, 
you're carrying forward success strategies that worked in high school because if you came into a high school teacher and showed an interest and said, I really kind of like what you're doing, that was rewarded. And, you know, honestly, I try to reward it as well. But there are other things in college about the professor's role that force them to behave a little differently. After you have your kind of theories about what to do, you know, waving my arms around didn't get me any food, crying did, ah, let's file that. You know, you eliminate some theories. When I'm hungry, I don't wave my arms around. When I am trying to figure out how to be a success in college, hmm, maybe, you know, reading the book is good, being, you know, telling the professor about your personal life and what's going on is fine. I'm incredibly accommodating. But at the end of the day, I have to grade. So, you know, those are my ways of, you know, doing the job well. You eliminate some theories that don't work. You experiment. At the end of the day, you will hopefully have solved your problem. You will go, oh, this is how college is. This is how I can succeed in college. This is how I can get the skills that I need to get a job after I leave here. At the end of that, you're not done. You don't cross the finish line. You usually have a new problem. Or some of us, okay, got my degree from college. Now what? Now I'm going to go into business. Now I'm going to take my first job. That's not, nobody's going to be a teacher there. I'm not going to have tests to tell me if I'm getting an A in my job. It's a different kind of a problem. And so the, pro the process continues. All life is problem solving. An amoeba that needs nutrition and kind of tentatively puts a little pseudopod out to reach out and grab for food is also problem solving. It moves in some directions, gets rewarded, some directions and doesn't. So how do we do science? Science really only makes progress by killing off theories. And what's left at the end of the day is our least damaged theory. It's the least worst. That doesn't mean that the theory is true. It just means that this is our best understanding as to what we have. And I have some more examples to talk about later in this lecture. There are some problems with science. One is called the spotlight nature of knowledge. That means where we've had success before, we kind of make little adjustments around that previous success. And we think we're solving the problem by kind of look, fiddling around the edges with our previous solutions. Maybe sometimes the answer to this is a completely different thing, an entirely different theory. And it's very exciting in science when people come up with those types of theories that no one's ever really thought of. They're kind of wacky, but they seem to work. The spotlight theory of knowledge is a little bit like that old joke about the drunk who was looking for his keys and he was looking underneath the lamppost and a fellow came up and said, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for my keys. Well, where did you lose them? Well, I lost them back there in the alley. Well, why are you looking underneath the street light? Well, because the light over here is better. You know, that's kind of one of the problems with the spotlight model. The other thing to remember is in science, there's no recipe for success. This is really frustrating to government officials because we tend to think that if we just find the right researcher to do the right study, they're going to produce a good theory and we will reward them. You know, it's a little bit, you know, we just don't know where success is going to come from. And this is why some granting agencies like the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Ed that funded me, they fund new studies, exploratory studies, generally speaking, ones that don't cost a lot of money, but involve a novel approach to things. Another problem with science is we don't know who to fix. So one of the things about the Morling theory data cycle issue is, gee, my data didn't work out the way I wanted it to. Do I throw out the theory? Or do I say, well, you know, this data really weren't quite good and I need to fix how I collect the data. We don't really know. Is it just messy data? Maybe that's our problem. 
So here's an example from astronomy. We knew for many, many years that there's something wrong with the orbit of the planet of Mercury. It did not behave according to Newton's laws for gravitation. And initially, well, maybe we're just not measuring things very well. Maybe that's the problem. And if our measurements got better and better. No, it's not our measuring. You know, there's something wrong with the data that we're getting back from Mercury. Over the course of time, we came to realize that it is the massive gravitational effect of the sun that causes the orbit of Mercury to be different. And when we had Einstein's theory of relativity, this gave us an explanation for the strange behavior of Mercury. Now, you know, if you think that Einstein's theory of relativity is something that's an egg-headed thing and not something that I'm really terribly interested in, I would have you remember that your cell phones work only because we make adjustments to the satellites which orbit the Earth to account for the theory of relativity, to account for the mass of the Earth and its effect on the rotation of the satellites around the Earth. So, you know, it's got an application. But, you know, the point of this slide is we don't often know. If sometimes what we're not explaining, ah, maybe we just don't have a good enough theory. Sometimes it's just static, decimal dust, imprecision of measurement, and we should just kind of ignore it. You know, and for many years before Einstein, we knew about this problem with Mercury. We just said, ah, you know, there's just something wacko about it. Mercury, don't know. And to some extent, don't care. So does our theory maybe need adjustment? Lakatos was a gentleman at the London School of Economics who was there with Popper. And he had a fascinating life story. If the communists would have not overtaken Hungary, he would have been prime minister. And, you know, the violence of the communist takeover, I think, kind of colored the way that he made theories. And he talked about the fact that if you really want to kill off a theory, you have to get at the core theory. You have to somehow insult the very principle of the theory and attack it in order to refute it. Because if you say, well, the data doesn't fit this particular aspect, sometimes there is this protective belt around a theory, little adjustments that the theory can make or little auxiliary hypotheses. They said, well, in this situation, it's a little bit different and it's a little bit refined, but the theory kind of still lives on, albeit with those little minor ad adaptations. But how are we gonna know when our theory is over adjusted, when it becomes so complicated and so twiddled and so refined that we just have no idea as to whether it is a viable theory anymore. And the important thing to do that Lakatos pointed out is you've got to design a test that's going to get at the core principles of the theory. And that's the only way to really attack it successfully. Returning now to the book a little bit, we've got some fancy words. So universalism, is the idea that scientific claims get evaluated according to their merit, regardless of who's doing it. This is why when you send an article in, it is anonymously reviewed. We don't want people to know who is doing it. And the same criteria apply to all scientists and all researchers. We don't just publish something because it was some guy at Harvard who you know kind of knows what they're doing. Even a student can do science. Undergraduates that I've worked with have published articles. You don't need an advanced degree. You don't need a research position. You do need to be stubborn and you do need to be willing to revise and resubmit, but everybody can do it. Communality. This is that part I was talking about earlier that science happens in a community and its findings belong to the community. So if you have a patented way of doing things, you'd say, well, here's, I have a cure for cancer, but I'm not going to tell anyone else about it and it's patented and it can't really be distributed. That's really not science. Science should work transparently and freely share the results of other work with our society, other scientists and the public. This issue of making money, this issue of pharmaceutical applications, this issue of successful psychotherapies, and who gets to profit off of them is a big problem. Science is disinterested. We're supposed to want to discover the truth and not be conveyed by our politics, our profit motive, 
our idealism, the way we hope the world should be, our conviction. That is, we're not supposed to say, this is how I think the world is, so no, I'm going to go out and find design a study that will show the rest of the world that this is how it is. When you do a study, you're supposed to appreciate it from a position of skepticism. Say, I really don't know. You're not supposed to spin the story. This is a real problem. A lot of literature that I've reviewed, say, in the area of positive psychology, you know, do you have grit? Do you have determination? Do you have a strong personality that will help you overcome adversity? Often those studies do not think of critical alternative explanations or reasonable skeptic could advance of it. It kind of, to my view, makes that not science. Your income and your prestige should not inter bias your interpretation. And finally, down here at the bottom, organized skepticism. Scientists should question everything, including their own theories. You should not believe what you're doing. You should run around. The idiom in English is kick the tires on this and think if you believe what you are reading, what you have done. You don't accept things at face value. You always ask to see the evidence. Okay. These four principles are important. They are key terms going to be on the test. You're going to see them in your life in later classes. So know what these are. So now a little bit of a word about basic and applied problems. Basic research is kind of trying to get at the establishment and measurement of the basic facts. Oh, I kind of like her example. What parts of the brain light up are activated when meditators meditate? How many drinks on average does an average MU student drink on Thursday night? You know, that's those are basic research questions. Translational research is one step removed from basic research to try to see if we can improve things on some other measure using the basic research we did. So her example is, if I bring some college students in and want to improve their GRE scores, can I give them meditation lessons and will that be efficacious? Will that be useful? Applied research is then actually going out into the field and making it happen in, real, in the real world. Can you initiate a meditation program in the school to help people? So that's kind of that continuum. You know, in my own research, I talked about basic research. We talked about how much people drink, who drinks, who reports engaging in regrettable sex after drinking and so forth. In translational work, we might look at talking with people who have experienced regrettable sex as a result of alcohol and looking at interventions that might help that person. And the applied research is implementing programs at the campus level or in the college counseling center or in the you know, various problem reduction programs that the university might choose to pay for. We talked about the fact that you've got to communicate these results. Well, <clears throat> we don't just do one thing. If you have a small study that you did and by small, you know, I can be pretty mechanical about this. About 15 pages, double space long in terms of a manuscript, you can submit that to a scientific journal. Scientific journal articles have high prestige. They get professors promotions. They get professors pay increases. They get professors grant money because they can say, look at all the work I have done in this area. This is a new study I want to do. That's kind of the, the lingua franca, the, the, the coin of the realm. You can also turn around and take your research and present it at a conference. This is often really useful because you'll get to see what other people are doing. And you'll get to think a little bit about how your work fits in with what other folks are doing and maybe get some new ideas for things that you need to do. Great way to meet your friends. And finally, you can publish a book. I published one on statistics, for example. You know, you might think, oh my gosh, they published a book. That's a great thing. And as a matter of fact, when we try to get professors from our department tenured, often people in English say, well, you know, they did a lot of articles, but where's their book? Well, in psychology, books don't count for very much. 
and there are royalties that come from books. It's not that much money, usually a few hundred dollars a year. Um, but it is an opportunity for you to pull all kinds of things together. So these various things are different sources of information for you as a student kind of wanting to learn about things. If you want a broad idea as to what's going on in this area, like what are the stresses commonly involved with people with gender identity issues in college? Probably a book is a good place or a review article is a good place to start, but not a scientific journal article because usually those scientific journal articles are focused on only one thing and not, not designed to give you a broad picture. Going to a conference is good. Sometimes it's a little bit of a problem kind of figure out who to listen to. Scientists also talk to the world of journalism. Uh, Kierkegaard, that Danish theologian, said, you know, I can think of no profession further removed from the throne of grace than that of journalist. If I had a daughter and she fell into prostitution, I would pray for her. But if I had a son and he became a journalist and remained so for five years, I would abandon hope entirely. Well, you know, journalism is out there. And it's important to communicate to journalists because they are the people who are going to transmit the information to society as a whole. There are risks. Journalists oversimplify. Journalists may engage in scientism. As the little commercial, a little comic on the right from PhD comedy shows, the university PR's office is just really happy to hear your, about your research and they'll spice up a little title for you. But things get kind of distorted as you continue on the way over. You know, also, journalists tend to look at stories that they see are important. New, breaking, sexy work. So if you've done something that's a replication of an earlier study, even if that replication is important, it's probably not gonna hit the media. And is the story accurate when you're working with journalists and how complete is it? Some of you are gonna be doing things, you know, in research methods two and the honor sequence where you will be doing studies and there will be journalists. You know, the Mizzou magazine likes to talk about undergraduate research and journalists will contact you. It's important for you to take ownership of that and to tell the journalist you're working with, great that you're talking with me. I just really look forward to your article. But before you submit that under deadline, I want to look at it to check it for accuracy. I've had a few experiences in Columbia from the time I've been here with the Tribune. And you know, after one time where they kind of omitted some important information, those are my rules. Happy to talk with you, but you know, do not work right up to the deadline until you've got to submit. I want to read this before you hit the submit button. Okay, that should be a good place to stop. I look forward to talking to you on Monday.